Welcome to the Unconventional Path, entrepreneurship and innovation stories and ideas. Hello, I'm Bela Musitz, coming to you from upstate New York. I am a former three-time entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and business school professor. And I'm Mike Wasserman, Professor of International Management at the Münster University of Applied Sciences here at my desk in beautiful Münster, Germany. Thanks for joining us today. You know, when Bela and I were both on the faculty of Clarkson University a few years ago, we would have lots of interesting conversations about how two of our favorite topics, innovation and entrepreneurship, are constantly evolving. We do this over coffee or lunch as time allowed. And then about two years ago, I moved to Germany, and shortly thereafter, Bela retired. But Bela had this idea to continue these conversations in the form of a podcast. I was highly skeptical at first because I'm not a podcast guy. But as we've now done over 70 episodes, I can honestly say we've had a great time. Haven't we, Bela? We sure have, Mike. But I want to question uh, your use of the word skeptical. Uh, I think uh, skeptical is too kind a way of saying your initial opinion of starting these podcasts. Yeah, I think I think I used the word. I think this is a horrible idea, Bella, but because I appreciate your friendship and I value you, I'll try it. I think horrible was the word. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember the word horrible. But you know, I'm wrong a lot. Well, this was one know. of those times. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm well, okay with that. Okay. That's okay. Okay, enough banter. Um, yes. yes, indeed, Mike. Uh, we sure have uh, had a good time. And um, we'd like to invite our listeners to join us each week as we talk with uh, some interesting entrepreneurs and to sh who share their stories and ideas. And, you know, our goal here is to bring you individuals who have taken the unconventional path to find happiness in life and at work. And one of the key elements of this podcast is to interview business founders we can all identify with. Our guests have included coffee roasters, software developers, business consultants, restaurant owners. You know, we want their stories to inspire you so that you can say, hey, I can do that, and then just maybe give you the push to start your own entrepreneurial adventure. And before we get to today's interview, we'd like to share with you that our podcast is brought to you in part by the law firm of Phillips Lytle, LLP. This is a sponsorship that makes a lot of sense to us. Bela, you know this firm well, don't you? Boy, I sure do. I have worked with the uh, partners at Phillips Lytle for over 20 years. Their nationally recognized attorneys take an entrepreneurial approach to legal matters, and they have a long, long history of success with startup businesses. Phillips Lytle is my go-to team for guiding startup businesses down the path to success, and we thank them for their continued support of the unconventional path. So let's dive into my conversation with today's guest, Ron Corey. He is a serial entrepreneur and an author of the book, Tenacity, a Vegas businessman survives Brooklyn, the Marines, corruption, and cancer to achieve the American dream. Hello, folks. Today, I'm with Ron Corey. Uh, he is a uh, Marine veteran, um, born in Brooklyn, and uh, has a uh, really fabulous story and has recently written a book. So I think that uh, today is going to be a great interview and conversation uh, between Ron and I. Uh, welcome to the show, Ron. Hi, Bella. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, for sure. So, Ron, let me ask you a question. Uh, if you're at a social event and uh, someone comes up to you and uh, introduces themselves to you and they say, nice meeting you, Ron. Uh, what do you do, uh, Ron? How do you answer that question? My answer to a question like that would be that I'm a serial entrepreneur. I term myself an observational niche finder. I live in Las Vegas now. I left Brooklyn when I was 19 and enlisted in the Marine Corps, settled in Vegas in 1974. And that was a small town back then. You could actually find opportunity in a product or service that no one else was offering or that very few offered, and you felt you could do it better. So I've ended up in over a dozen different businesses in this town before selling the last of them in 20. 15 and deciding to write my story in a book. Yeah, excellent. So, Ron, you used a term there that I'd like to uh, explore a little bit. Uh, you used uh, observational niche uh, finder. So explain what that is. Well, a niche finder is someone who finds a unique segment of industry that they can fill a need in. And in being an observational entrepreneur, 
I'm in the habit of starting my own business rather than acquiring one in many cases. So uh, one, one great example, uh, back in the early 80s, drinking and driving awareness was becoming a bigger thing. For many of your younger listeners, they have no clue. But to inform them a little bit, uh, if you had too many drinks, and I was in the tavern and restaurant business, so if you've had too many drinks and a cop pulls you over, they might call you a cab. They might take your keys and tell you to pick it up at the local police station the next day. Today, and for the last 30 years, drinking and driving is a major concern in, on a societal level, but it wasn't always that way. So back in the early 80s, I identified a niche in Las Vegas in the form of a quality limousine service. Uh, the limousine services in town up to that point were pretty much airport transfers. People who didn't want to take a traditional taxi from the airport would take a limo for an hour and go from the airport to their hotel. So I started a company called Presidential Limousine Service in 1984 with high quality stretch limousines, tuxedo chauffeurs, fully stocked bars in the car. And that was a niche that I felt I could fill because it was there was nothing like that being done at the time. And I've done that in 1979 with the tavern business. Long before a TV show we are all familiar with today called Cheers, I wanted to operate a bar where everyone knew your name. That's actually a term from the theme song of the show Cheers. But I did that before Cheers was a show. Bought a little tavern, operated it, parlayed it into a tavern restaurant, gaming parlor, and parlayed that into four tavern locations sprinkled around the Las Vegas Valley. Wow. that's uh, Those are some really good stories. So let's go back a little bit. Uh, uh, born in Brooklyn? Correct. Born in Brooklyn. Yeah. And uh, so uh, are you, were your uh, parents entrepreneurs or entrepreneurship in the family? No, my family worked traditional jobs on Wall Street for brokerage houses. Um, I don't believe I, I got the entrepreneurial gene from anyone. I just had a desire to generate revenue where there was none. And uh, one story I tell in my book, which, by the way, is entitled Tenacity. Uh, when I was 12 years old, I was attending a small parochial school in downtown Brooklyn. And you had a traditional white shirt, tie, black pants and shoes. And the nuns in my school expected your shoes to be shined. So for one Christmas, one of the gifts I received was an old fashioned wooden shoe shine box. Uh, it has a hinge top, and inside are the, the things you need to use to shine your shoes. And although my dad wa got it for me so I could shine my shoes for school every day, I took it down to the subway stop at the bottom of my street, and for 30 minutes before school each day, was able to charge 10 cents a shine for gentlemen who were getting on the subway to go to Wall Street, downtown Manhattan, to go to work, and made a buck or two a day at the age of 12. And I got such a thrill from that. I think that instilled in me an entrepreneurial spirit to continue that after the Marine Corps. Uh, initially, we I got to Vegas with very little money. So I was a casino dealer. And uh, as a second job, I got a real estate salesman license and parlayed both jobs into my first entrepreneurial experience, which was a small neighborhood tavern that uh, I purchased in 1979 and then parlayed that into a printing company, a wholesale mirror and glass company, a limousine company, uh, a number of new car dealerships, both in Las Vegas and California. And over the course of 45 years, acquired or developed over a dozen businesses. So I believe I found a number of niches that proved to be uh, the career path I chose. Yeah. And those were very diverse businesses, right? I mean, a, a tavern, a, a, a car dealership, a limousine service. Those are sort of really very, very different businesses. So what was sort of the, you know, what, what was the spark or the thing that said, Hey, I, I want to, I now have a tavern <laughs> that's being successful. Um, uh, 
now I want to go, you know, do this other thing. What was what was sort of the motivation there? I, I think there was just an excitement into, into creating something from nothing, hoping it would be profitable. But mostly it was the joy of dealing with adversity head on and overcoming the challenges you were faced with. For example, uh, typical taverns in the Las Vegas community, unlike Atlantic City, are allowed to engage in gaming. And a typical tavern was limited to 15 machines. Well, in the 70s and early 80s, there was no interactive gaming. So a typical tavern had two or three pull handle slot machines in the corner. Most local customers didn't care about those. Tourists did. Well, when Cy Red, fellow that founded IGT, International Gaming Technology, invented video poker, my book goes into the fact that my early business partner, Marine Corps buddy, worked with Cy Red at Bally Manufacturing and Bally Distributing. Cy Red was a salesman of slot machines. He developed video poker, offered it to the heads of Bally's who laughed at him and said, people who play machines don't want to think. They don't want to interact. You can have that idea. You don't build slot machines. We won't build video poker machines. Cy Red parlayed that into what is now known as interactive gaming. And slot machine floors change dramatically from what used to be 70% live table games, 20 to 30% machines, into the actual reverse. Most of the casino floor are now large LED screened gaming machines, and about 20 to 25% of the floor are gaming tables. Yeah. Well, I wanted to develop a tavern with more than the traditional 15 machines and found that in Las Vegas with that limitation, I had to go to an outlying jurisdiction that had no such limitation. And part of my book talks about encountering a small town corrupt councilman. And he was a competitor in the graphics industry in Las Vegas and he used his power as a councilman, which is the nightmare of an entrepreneur to have a governing authority the city you're looking to open your business in that was a competitor of yours and to use his power as a councilman to defeat you and limit you from going into business. Actually got his small town police department to frame me in a crime to try to keep me from getting a gaming license at that location. And the book goes into the challenges that I was faced with trying to get non-restricted gaming in this tavern facility I was going to build and how I overcame that adversity at that city in the Supreme Court and beat them in the criminal court system. And I think the story I tell as part of my autobiography is a motivational, inspirational type story of how to deal with adversity head on and overcome it. Yeah. And there are some creative tales I tell in my book. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when did your book come out, Ron? I released it a year ago, January of 19. Okay, and, and the title is uh, Tenacity? The title is Tenacity. It's available in hardcover, paperback, Kindle. And I hired an actor named Michael Madsen to record my audio book. Many people may not know him by his name, but he's a very familiar face with 300 movies to his credit. He was in Donnie Brasco, Reservoir Dogs, uh, Free Willy, and Kill Bill. And and when they see his picture, they say, oh, yeah, I know that guy. <laughs> yeah, And he's yeah. got a very distinct voice. And he actually recorded my audio book. Oh, uh, wonderful, wonderful. And uh, <clears throat> what was sort of your, your, your motivation to sort of, you know, take uh, pen to paper and uh, write, write the book? I mean, that's a pretty big undertaking. Well, from... From 2010 to 2015, I got into the car business with a buddy of mine that moved here from Texas named Don Timboro, very successful car dealer, successful car dealer around the country, who sold his dealerships, retired in Vegas, and his friends, we were just going to run around together and have fun, both sort of retired, when we decided we might have one more empire building opportunity ahead of us, and we got back in the car business. Uh, and parlayed that into a half a dozen dealerships. And through 2010 to 2015, we did that. Ultimately, I sold my taverns, 
my other businesses, sold my interest in the car dealerships, and trying to decide what to do with myself in my early 60s, where I was pretty much retired, but I was bored. And I decided to tell the story of what occurred to me in that gaming opportunity and let a whole autobiography story be surrounded by that, uh, that challenge I faced with that corrupt city councilman and told a fact-based story about my life. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Well, we will uh, definitely have uh, that in the show notes, folks, uh, with a link to uh, Amazon so that uh, you can buy uh, Ron's book and read it. It sounds really fascinating. So, Ron, you've started lots and lots of businesses here. Um, and as you said, you, you start them from the ground up. You don't acquire them. So what were some of the what were the top three challenges that that you would see in starting these businesses outside of the corrupt councilman? Right. We understand that one. Well, that was a unique challenge. Well, in the limousine industry, uh, you don't just buy a limousine and go into business. If you're in public transportation, you have state oversight. Well, in this community, the state of Nevada regulated limousine companies through the Public Service Commission. I had to go through a series of hearings to apply for a certificate of convenience and public necessity. Existing limousine companies opposed your license just to limit competition. And uh, that was challenging, even though I could show that there was a need for what I was going to offer because a vast majority of the time, if you called for a limousine, they told you they were sold out. They were booked. Yeah. You couldn't get one. Yeah. So, so in preparing for my public service commission hearings, I actually created a, a log of, of over 100 calls for service where more than 90% of the time I was denied service because uh, they, they claimed they were sold out and created a large show card that demonstrated a graph to the Public Service Commission that when my opponents claimed there was no need for a new company, I could show there was a need for it because they were turning down over 90% of the applicants. So that was a significant hurdle, and that's how I overcame it in the hearings and prevailed and opened presidential here in Las Vegas, ultimately selling it, and it's still operational today as a premier uh, stretch limo service in the Vegas community. Yeah, yeah, so, very nice. Uh, that was one example uh, a challenge I had to overcome, which no one ever wants to hear the word cancer. But in 2005, I was in great shape, 53 years old, and went through an annual physical when they found a tumor at the base of my esophagus. I did some research. Esophageal cancer has an 8% survival rate. So I researched the best surgeon for that type of surgery, went to what was ultimately uh, USC, medical hospital in Southern California and had an 11 hour surgery where they removed my esophagus and half my stomach attached my remaining stomach to my throat. And yeah, that was a five year recovery period. Wow. That surgery. So invasive. Uh, that was a major channel cha challenge in my life, just trying to survive. So Ron, uh, let me take a second here. Uh, Every once in a while, your video, excuse me, the sound breaks up. So I'm going to turn, let's turn off our cameras here. Um, and uh, that'll, that'll kind of save some bandwidth. So I think if you just click on the camera icon, it will turn it off. There you go. And uh, yep. you can still hear me. I hear you fine. Yep. And I hear you as well. So this will just save some bandwidth and uh, hopefully the audio won't, uh, won't break up going forward. Okay, well, we'll pick it up from here. Okay. So, Ron, that was uh, certainly, uh, you know, having health challenges are, are sort of another category of challenges that, that we sort of uh, sometimes have to deal with. Uh, what was sort of the number one thing you learned from that experience? I'd say the biggest thing was that nothing of any value comes without challenges. And if you can get it in your head, to demonstrate some determination, perseverance, and diligence, there is virtually no obstacle you can't find a way over, around, or directly through 
to make your goal successful. Yeah. Yeah. So as you were saying that, it, it sort of made me want to ask you this next question. So at a pretty young age, you joined the Marines. Um, what were what were some of the things that you took away from there? Well, one of the things that the Marines instills in its recruits is that failure is not an option. Uh, they train you physically and mentally to take on any adversity head on. And I found that to be very helpful to me in business, particularly in the early days in the tavern business, where you might find people uh, becoming a bit rambunctious and you'd have to physically help them out of the property because they were just contrary to reason. And being in good shape, working out daily, having the training the Marine Corps instilled in me was very helpful as I developed four taverns in an early and young Las Vegas where drinking was a lot more, a lot more predominant than it is today. Yeah, yeah. And, and Ron, when you've started all of these businesses, um, did you finance them yourself? Did you get partners to help you finance them? Sort of talk about that, the sort of capital raising process in, in, in getting these things going. Sure. Uh, well, the first tavern, I actually was tasked with finding a tavern to purchase for the pit boss at the Tropicana where I was a dealer. I dealt at night. I was selling real estate during the day. He asked me to find a tavern for him to purchase because his daughter was a bartender and he thought it would be a good investment for him that she could manage. I identified a tavern opportunity that was for sale in town. He ended up not purchasing it because he wanted to be in another part of town, closer to where he lived. And I decided that this tavern opportunity might be something that my limited formal education would enable me to do. I just had to raise the money. Coincidentally and fortuitously, at the same time, I was selling an investment property for one of my fellow dealers, and he was netting out the $35,000 that the guy selling the tavern was looking for a down payment. And one of the things that I think your listeners might find interesting is when they think something like, oh, I can't do that. I don't have the money to do it. Some of the most outlandish sources might be an opportunity if they would drum up the courage to ask. Just go for it and ask. So I went to this fella that I worked with at the Tropicana with his closing documents and uh, proceeds check. And I said, hey, Jose, what are you going to do with this $35,000? And he said, I don't know. I guess I'll put it in the bank. I said, the bank will offer you 6% interest per year. I'll offer you 12. I want to buy this business, and this is the amount I need. He signed the check over to me, and an opportunity for me was created. Uh, my buddy and I from the Marine Corps, we're going to do the bar deal together. The $35,000 came from Jose's check, and we raised a little bit of money between the two of us uh, just from savings and uh, refinancing our two vehicles for operating money. And we went into that tavern on a wing and a prayer and parlayed it into everything we built from that point on. Wow. 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 So, uh, Ron, um, it sounds like you've had uh, several partners along the way, uh, either active or passive. Um, how do you sort of uh, uh, find a partner? What, what, what has your experience there been like in finding partners and deciding whether I want to partner with this person or not? Well, in my case, I didn't take finding a partner lightly because that's, it's, it's as close to a marriage as you can get. You need someone you like, you can trust, and that you share the same business philosophy with. So in my case, any partnerships I engaged in, these guys were my friends before they were ever considered for a partnership. Uh, and and I think that's, that's what predates becoming a business partner, is to have a friendship with them, a level of trust, and then know that you share the same business philosophy. And then when a business opportunity comes up and you could use a partner to either help you with the workload or with the financial ramifications of acquiring the business, uh, that that friend slash partner 
becomes your business partner. But the friendship endures the partnership. Right. It survives it. Right. Did you have uh, did you have any um, did you have any uh, friendships that got strained uh, once you got into business? Were there any challenges there that that um, maybe you you didn't realize might happen going in? Well, I was fortunate that that didn't occur because uh, there there were primarily those two partnerships and those gentlemen were friends for years before we went into business together. And even after we sold the business, that friendship continued. So I think if you make good choices in who you select for a partner, uh, you, you don't regret it because you know who you're dealing with. I know of many partnerships that didn't work out and and they may not have been friendships. They may have been acquaintances that got strained due to uh, a lack of either business integrity or or a feeling that one guy didn't think the other guy's business judgment was uh, attuned to his. But in my two cases with Dan Hughes and Don Tamburo, uh, we knew each other quite well, and those partnerships survived all the challenges of business, and the friendships continued long after we sold those businesses. Mm, excellent. Excellent. So again, Ron, you've started many diverse businesses here, uh, from a tavern to car dealerships. Uh, when you think about hiring people, uh, hiring employees, what are some of the things that you look for in, in prospective new employees? Well, in, in the uh, more recent years, I developed a practice of anyone I was going to hire or go into business with uh, as an investor. Uh, and I would ask them if they'd be willing to let me do a full background check on them. And first, the, the, the first caution is if someone tells you, no, you can't have my date of birth and social security number and do a background check. I tell them there's, there's no reason to talk any further. Mm -hmm. and, and when it does go to that point, I, I have a licensed private investigator that I, that I provide the name, date of birth and social to, he does a background check. And uh, if I like what I see, I will offer that person an opportunity. If I don't like what I see, then I won't. Yeah. And generally, if someone's a good guy, they're a good guy their whole lives. If they've had a blip in the radar somewhere in their background and you just decide not to do business with them, it's generally a good course of action. Mm -hmm. And that's how I've operated the last 15 to 20 years. Yeah. Was there, was there an event that sort of made you adopt that practice that said, hey, I should do this from now on? Well, the instance that I described that occurred in uh, that, that tavern opportunity in an outlying jurisdiction in Las Vegas, uh, the employee that the councilman used to frame me in a criminal charge, had we done a background check on him, we would have never hired him. He was an opportunistic, uh, drug-dealing piece of trash who the councilman uh befriended and used to make unfounded charges against me. Yeah. Had that person not been employed by us, we would have never been in a position I found myself in. And ultimately, clearly I'm here, I've, I'm a free man, and my accuser ended up going to prison, yeah. which anyone who decides to get the book will, will enjoy hearing how this all developed and how we prevailed. Yeah, yeah, wow. Uh, <clears throat> So in addition to these background checks, what other sort of things do you look for in potential employees? Well, years before I, I did that, I went by gut instinct. You know, you'd conduct a detailed interview with a job applicant. You'd call their past employers, their past landlords, get a feel for the person. Pretty much what, what a private investigator does today that I have the luxury of being able to afford. But doing some of that legwork myself and going with my gut instinct on on the interview face to face with the employee and calling you know many many people get they get a job application from someone and that application will generally show past employment past residences but they don't do the legwork and and ask people about them they either assume it to be true or just don't spend the time 
to look into it. But you learn so much when you do a little investigative work, whether you hire someone or do it yourself. And I would advise anyone to not only go by their face-to-face -face interview with a with an employee applicant, but actually put a little bit of time into the things that their employment application indicates and find one, were they totally truthful in what they provided to you? And two, what did the people that know them that have previously employed them or previously rented them a residence have to say about them? And you, you generally can uh, narrow it down to people that you do want to employ and entrust with your products, goods, or cash. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting you, you bring that up because in my past lives, I've, I've had opportunities to hire people. And like you, I, did, I used to do all my own reference checks on, on prospective employees. And I, I was amazed, not just reference checks, but also validation of employment and degrees, uh, education, et cetera. And, and it was, uh, I was amazed at the number of times where I'd go to verify a degree from a university uh, or verify uh, dates of employment <clears throat> that that were false on the resume, and it and it was yeah, it was like mind boggling to me, right? And then you'd say, okay, well maybe somehow there's an error and misunderstanding, and I would I would uh, uh, call up the prospective employee and say, hey, listen, I, I called up so and so university, and they said that you never went there. What's the story? And you know they basically hung up and left. So. Then you're a dial tone, yes, yeah. exactly. So well, it, it's remarkable. Well, yeah, it's remarkable, and I think a lot of people don't realize the importance of that follow-up, and they don't do it. Right. But right. it's an opportunity that's missed. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I've learned a lot from being in business for myself, and when I decided to uh, sell my businesses and be semi-retired, I put the word out that, that I, I, I wasn't quite done but I didn't want to start a new business. There, you know, you spend 12 hour days running a business and between the health challenges and my age, you got to know your limitations. So I put the word out that I was available and I've since joined three boards as a director where I can help guide a big ship uh, with my experience. And I think that's another thing people can do when they have something to contribute in the form of the experience I do and serve on a board of directors of a large company uh, or, or a startup and, and apply what they've learned to those businesses. Yeah. And that's now I'm on the board of a large furniture company in Las Vegas called Walker Furniture. I'm on the board of a new startup educational tool called Square Panda with uh, Andre Agassi, the tennis pro that lives in Las Vegas. He's an investor with me and on the board. And I'm on the board of a charity called the Wounded Blue Foundation that helps injured police officers around the country that are not currently getting uh, able to get support from the agency they've, they've worked for if they're in a small town with a small budget. Um, so that's another way to stay active is to serve on boards. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, um, there are lots and lots of opportunities uh, uh, in wherever you live uh, to get involved and to share your experience and your expertise with, you know, whether it be not-for-profit organizations uh, or whether it be for, you know, larger corporations or startups, et cetera. And I, <clears throat> I always encourage people to uh, to do that and, and sort of give back. Uh, for the most part, we've all been very fortunate, and um, it's a great opportunity uh, to give back and to help others. Yeah, I I, I would also share an angle with you for your listeners that are getting into business uh, as, a, as a more of a newcomer, that uh, even the adversity that I described, you will find that in your city, the local reporters from the newspaper and the uh, TV stations are sometimes starved for a good story. And while you may be encountering some adversity, as I did, uh, by reaching out to them and offering to share your story, you can turn that adversity into news, which is free advertising, and your your business and your situation ends up in the paper or on the TV network news channels, and you turn it into advertising, where people who never even heard of you learn about you, and by turning adversity into a news story, 
you create advertising for your business. And I have found that to be very helpful as well. Yeah, that's an excellent, excellent point, Ron. And 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 when you're in a, a magazine or you're on on the news or the TV, there's a certain amount of, of validity that goes with that uh, that people people give it versus you running you know an ad on a billboard, right? They see something right. on a billboard, they know it's an ad, but they they see right. a three minute story about your business as an up and coming business in town on news. All of a sudden, it's it's your in essence been validated. Uh, and, and you're right, exactly right. And if you do head counts of people coming into your business every day, when you do find yourself in the middle of a news story, uh, you'll see a dramatic increase in that in that traffic count of your customer base. Yeah, yeah. Now, Ron, you've sold several businesses. Uh, what were some of the key takeaways uh, in in or things that you learned from selling a business? Well, the biggest takeaway is. The guy who's buying your business may not run it the way you did. So I've always tried to avoid carrying paper. I want them to find their money to buy me out somewhere else and not ask me to be their lender. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I've had opportunities where I developed, in one case, it was a tavern that uh, my book goes into some detail with. And uh, we developed it. We, we, we opened it. We started it and sold it to some people. And uh, they took everything we suggested and pretty much did the opposite. And uh, within a matter of months, had to turn over the keys because they couldn't afford to make the payments on it. And we had to uh, remodel and rebuild that business from the ground up. But, uh, you know, if you have the luxury of building a successful business, I avoid carrying paper. Yeah. Let them money somewhere else would be my advice yeah good 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 solid advice what would what would your number two piece of advice be well if if you're not desperate to sell then try to find someone who comes to the table with experience one of the things that uh that happens is uh, people think they can do something you've done successfully but they've never done it before if they come to table with some business experience, whether it's it's in your area of industry or not, um, unless you are in a position where you have to sell, try to find someone that comes to the table with experience, and that will enhance the likelihood of their success. Because it's not always just getting paid off. You know, you I, I had employees that worked for me for 20 years, and they were going to end up being employees of the buyer of my business. And you really care about these people. You know, you've watched them get married, have children, and, and develop, develop their lives around this employment that you've provided them. And you want them to be in a successful scenario. So you don't always want to just take the money and run because you find that you, you do care about the people that worked for you. Yeah, yeah. Excellent advice. Excellent advice. So, Ron, you've you've started many businesses over many, many years. Uh, do you think it's gotten harder or easier to start businesses? Well, I I think it depends on the jurisdiction you're in. You know, when I came to a young Las Vegas in 1972, it was much easier to find a niche that wasn't being filled than it is in this same community today with almost 3 million residents compared to 150,000 residents when I got here. So sometimes you might be uh, an individual looking to start your own business and you have to find the right community to do it in. And sometimes those younger, upcoming, small town type communities are a lot easier to do it in than a fully developed large city. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Sometimes the opportunity when, when things are growing, uh, usually uh, it's uh, the opportunities are, are more uh, forthcoming uh, as opposed to when when the, it's flat or uh, the, the population is decreasing. Uh, so right. that, that's a that's a good uh, good observation. <clears throat> you know, don't don't think it out of the uh, scope of reality to relocate to do something. You know, there are there are still a lot of small towns in in this great country of ours and. Uh, if you have the willingness and the gumption to do uh, a startup, 
uh, sometimes you have to think outside of the box and relocate to do it to enhance the likelihood of success. Yeah, yeah. So, Ryan, let me uh, jump back to the book for a second. Uh, what type of individual do you think uh, should really read your book? Can you describe who you think the ideal reader of your book would be? Well, you know, my book describes uh, a life story that takes you from uh, childhood in New York to uh, enlisting in the service and then being relocated by the military to the, from the East Coast to the West Coast and then uh, completing your military service and moving into a small town that is a unique small town with gaming. So there are transplanted New Yorkers that count in the millions around the country that would enjoy a story of a guy going from Brooklyn to Vegas through the Marine Corps. There are possible uh, book enthusiasts that are fond of the military or patriotic that would enjoy aspects of the book that I described. I, I, I tried to write a book that didn't just tell a story that was interesting for uh, entrepreneurial wannabes, but also told a good story about uh, going into business with nothing, uh, moving into a new town. Uh, there's a broad spectrum of reader that would enjoy the story that Tenacity tells. Excellent. Excellent. So, Ron, uh, I want to wrap this up. Uh, we've been going at it for almost 40 minutes. Uh, are there any th questions or topics that uh, I should have asked you that I haven't? Is there anything else you want to add to this conversation? Well, if anyone was interested in anything I had to say and they want to do a little more research before deciding to purchase the book, I want to make you aware of my the website that that uh, we've created that describes a little more of the book. There are photographs uh, attached in the gallery, and I want to provide you the website name. That'd be perfect. Can you give that, and I'll make sure we put it in the show notes. Yes. The, the website is www roncoreyauthor.com and my last name is spelled C-O-U-R-Y so roncoreyauthor.com will provide a great deal of detail about the book and there's a quick link on the website to the Amazon link if someone wants to get it perfect, perfect, well I will make sure that's in our show notes uh, that was excellent, so thank you very much for taking the time to uh, have this conversation Ron, uh, I and our listeners really appreciate it uh, it's been a fascinating story, and um, I wish you well going forward. Thank you very much. Well, I'd also like to thank you for giving me this opportunity. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. Well, Bela, what a character Ron was. I mean, what a story, huh? Um, and this is kind of a side of entrepreneurship that we really haven't touched on. I mean, in over, what, 70-plus episodes or whatever we're at here? Um you know, and it's realistic in a lot of contexts, corruption and legal issues and all this kind of stuff that was going on in the in the uh, the limousine business in Vegas. Um, it's the uglier side in some ways of entrepreneurship, but it's really there. What's your experience um, with businesses like this and how do you give businesses like this advice? Boy, you know, uh, there are always challenges uh, when you're uh, when you're trying to start a new endeavor. Uh, whether it's from your competition, uh, who's going to make it difficult for you to uh, get into that business. I mean, I think back to uh, Uber and Lyft. Uh, you know, when they started trying getting into big cities, boy, the taxi cab guys really fought them hard and they, you know, fought back and they said, hey, you know, these guys are not safe. They came up with all these reasons to try to make it really, really difficult um, for Uber and Lyft uh, to enter certain markets. Um, so you're always going to have somebody pushing against you. You're always going to have somebody fighting against you. <clears throat> the challenges are when you are in a regulated industry <clears throat> or one that comes under the jurisdiction of uh, uh, some public sector entity, um, oftentimes there are non-rational things that will happen to make your business life uh, difficult and challenging. And um, I don't know how to get around those other than, uh, you know, I, I always, <clears throat> quite honestly, I always am concerned a little bit about businesses 
where with the stroke of a pen, you can be out of businesses, right? We, we had the same conversation uh, or we had a, a similar business in, in get mails or get, get emails, right? Where mm-hmm. with the stroke of a pen, uh, as they did in Europe, uh, that business doesn't work. Right. And Adam said he can't sell his product in Europe because of the, the regulations. Right. And, you know, in, in some of these businesses, when you fall into that, <clears throat> into that space, uh, you know, one week of uh, a, a bad story in the press and boy, you have you run the risk of, of being shut down. Health department and restaurants, right? One one run in with a health department and your restaurant can be sunk, right? That's right. That's right. So you, you really got to, <clears throat> number one, you got you to gotta understand these things. Number two, uh, you really need to run a clean, ethical, and 100% honest uh, business. And I think in the long run, you'll do okay, just like Ron did in the long run. He came out okay. And I'm sure there were points in time where he thought, oh, crap, this isn't going well. Um, and and uh, so I just think it's something you got to persevere. And it's, it's part of, in some businesses, it's the part of the hurdles that you have to jump over and get through in order to be in business. Yep. Keep your eyes wide open because really these roadblocks or threats or whatever you want to call them can come from all directions. Um, and yeah, having, and this again, I think we're having a good network is really important. So if it's a legal thing, you have a good lawyer. If it's a financial thing, you've got a good accountant, right? And it's, I think it's the important of having established before you start relationships with the team. We've talked a few times about the importance of, instead of just filling out the legal forms online, having a relationship with a lawyer, having a relationship with a banker, having a relationship with an accountant, so that when these things happen, you've got some trusted sources who know you and know your business and can give you good guidance uh, to get through these things. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, hey, Mike, there was another thing that we talked about was sort of, you know, background checks and reference checks. What what was your sort of take on that? Well, this is interesting because, you know, I guess I, I completely agree that you should do your due diligence and that you should, um, you should, do reference checks. I mean, I can't tell you how many hundreds or probably over a thousand. I've been on the other end of students, right, getting needing references. Um, so I've been on both ends of asking for the reference and giving the reference. Um, and yeah, a really good reference can be a really important indicator in um, it, it, this, it, in terms of making a hiring decision. A lot of people wait until the very last minute and after they're already decided to make an offer and then they do as the final check, a reference check, I don't want to agree with the timing of that. I think that you should do it earlier because I think that there can be information that could lead you maybe to make a different choice. So I think that should be weighted uh, earlier in the process um, and then um, a- a- and feed into the decision making process. So I think the timing is, is really important. Um, you know, and I also think that you have to understand the type of job that you're going after. I think, and this is the same thing holds true for drug testing is, you know, or criminal record checks or things like this, that, you know, there's a big segment of the U.S. population. I mean, we inc- uh, incarcerate more people, right, than anybody, any other country per capita in the OECD, in the, in the developed economies. Um, we have a high rate of drug use and drug abuse in the country. And that doesn't necessarily, recreational drug use doesn't necessarily disqualify people, I think, for all jobs. Um, I think that it's that it's something that's part of U.S. society. Here in Europe, it's a little bit different in terms of the understandings. But I think from my U.S. background is, you know, if you want to disqualify people for having a positive recreational drug test, or you want to disqualify people for having um, a, a felony on their record, I think as a blanket disqualification now for some jobs okay it's absolutely critical if you're going to be you know working with small children or things like that but there's certain types of jobs where i think that you have to okay i know what it is but that's not going to be a stopper um i'm a big believer in giving people second chances i'm a big believer in giving people opportunities um so you know i guess yeah i want to know what i'm getting into so yeah do the background check but then you need to know what to do with that information. And that's a really important kind of, I think, understanding. And I've been involved in a couple of different businesses where, you know, um, if you if you DQ'd everybody on your list with a with a positive drug test, right, or a drug arrest, there's going to be very few people left in the pool and you're going to throw away a lot of really potentially valuable employees. 
So that's kind of my take on this, Bella. And maybe the listeners don't agree with me. And I certainly agree that there's a lot of jobs where it's critical that you have a clean record and that you don't use recreational drugs. But I think if you're really realistic and you're looking at jobs um, that maybe aren't super high wage and they aren't super kind of uh, complex jobs and you're looking for people that might have some of these things on their record that you don't want to overlook them or pass them over just because they have you know, a, a positive drug test or a, a, a certain types of um, arrests on their record. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. So I think you said a couple of really interesting things there, Mike. I, th- I think this notion of doing reference checks earlier is really, really a good one. Uh, because not only, oftentimes when you wait till the end, you're sort of already emotionally committed to the candidate. And, and uh, you know, it's like you might gloss over stuff that people say. And I think doing them earlier then actually helps you in your conversations and discussions with the candidate because it gives you things that you can probe a little bit deeper and try to understand better. So I'm a big, number one, I'm a big proponent of doing them earlier as opposed to later. And I'm also a big proponent that I want to do them. I don't want to farm these out to HR or to a recruiting firm. I want to talk to those individuals that serve as reference checks. I don't want this to come in and, you know, a third party report that someone wrote. Uh, So I want to do them. Especially because nuance is important because a lot of people are afraid of being sued or whatever. So they're going to give messages that are very nuanced. And I know I found myself doing the same thing and I try to be very direct and things that I can back up. Um, But yeah. And to understand the nuance, you're right. You have to be part of the conversation. You have to be part of it, right? Absolutely. So I want to do those. And I think the, the other comment I'll make is, you know, giving people a second chance, I think, is really important. Um, and, you know, some of that, f- from my perspective, is this notion of how long ago did, did the, uh, the, the 10 seconds of bad judgment happen, <laughs> right? So if, if, it, if it was last week you know, and it's the third time, then that's a totally different message than something that happened to someone when they were, you know, 16 or 18 or 21 or 22. And now they're 30 or 40. And it's still, for whatever reason, it's on their, it's on their record. It's going to show up. Uh, but you can tell whether that person, um, has, uh, has sort of, uh, taken care of that business and, and is, is now, you know, going to be a, a great, contributing person. And oftentimes I'm a believer that those mistakes that we make, make us better people, right? I'm, mm-hmm. I'm a firm believer in that. I mean, there's plenty of mistakes I've made and plenty of things I've screwed up. And, um, as long as I don't keep repeating them, uh, I think I've learned from them and it's made me more, more, uh, uh harder working and sort of more driven to accomplishing things. Yeah. Great example. One of my best friends, I'll keep him anonymous, uh, from when I was in college and right after college got right after college, got a, a drunk driving, uh, arrest and lost his job because of it. Um, but I know for a fact that he hasn't had another drunk driving offense since. Um, and I kind of lost touch with him actually, but up until the last time I talked to him, um, several years ago, I, I know that he learned from that and I know that changed his behavior. And, um, you know, I know that it didn't affect his career, but if you said, oh, I'm disqualifying everybody with a drunk driving offense, right? You would right. have lost him and I'm, sh- you know, he would be a great person to, to, uh, yeah. Talk. So I think one of the things I look for in these cases is, is this notion of has the person learned from that bad decision they made, yeah. right? And, and give the and person a chance the- to talk about it, right? Ask the person Absolutely. about it. Hey, we did a background check and this came up. Yeah. Talk What's to me the about story? this. Yeah. Right. Right? And, you know, how they articulate that, how they talk about it, I think gives you a lot of insight as as to whether they have used it as a learning experience and and have gotten it behind them and are now moving forward and 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 will probably be a great performer and really help in, in your business versus someone who's not. That's why, again, having I like to have these conversations directly. Yeah. And think about it. Right. So either a you're like, okay, you know, I know about it and you know about it. So this is all open and on the table. And if it does work out great. And if it doesn't work, I could say, Hey, you know, we talked about this during your interview and you said this wasn't going to be a problem and you said it was fixed and here we go. So we need to write this up and we need to 
um, to document this because if something like this happens again, we're going to have to make a change. Right. 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 It's it's easily handled. Yep. So Great. all right. My last question for you, Bill. I thought that uh, Ron talked about this idea where he's serving on boards, kind of in his post-retirement. Uh, uh, activities to, to keep him engaged and interested. I, I think it's great. I think it's actually great to serve on boards pre-retirement also. Um, do you serve on any, any boards? And if so, what do you get out of it? And, uh, you know, kind of how do you see this fitting into people's lives? And how do people get involved with maybe going about positioning themselves to be asked to do this? Kind of what's your what's your take on this? Yeah, uh, I think serving on boards is, is really important. I've been on a lot of boards um, in, in my in my previous uh, incarnations and jobs I've had. And, and sometimes you get on boards because of the position you have, right? So if you are, uh, you know, uh, the hospital president in town, uh, you're probably going to be asked to get on at least one bank board. You're going to be asked to be on the Chamber of Commerce board, right? So some, some positions you get because, uh, some board positions you get because of the, the position you hold uh, professionally. Um, but I will tell you that I have served on, on a, on a handful of boards, some for-profit business. Of course, in my venture days, I served on a lot of boards, uh, every board, every company we invested in, uh, myself or one of my partners was on the the board. And, um, I also served on a lot of not-for-profit boards from the chamber, uh, to the community hospital here in town. And I, in every one of those experiences, I learned something as an individual, Right. I either I either saw uh, the you know the CEO or the president of the corporation. Uh, I learned about running meetings. I learned about uh, how not to run meetings on some occasions. Uh, you know, I've learned how to how to deal with how they deal with difficult situations. Uh, in in a lot of these organizations, sometimes stuff happens, and it's not always good news. So you know, as a board member, you're involved and you're helping, but. I certainly, the pressure is different than when you're the president or CEO or founder of that business because I've experienced it on both sides of that equation. So I think uh, a board member uh, is a great learning opportunity. It's also a great opportunity to give back uh, and to sort of uh, help others with your experiences and, and share those. And um, I, the other thing I've noticed is, is there's a real difference in boards, uh, some boards are very operationally oriented. In other words, they get involved or in the running of the business, uh, and other boards are much more hands-off and strategic. And I'm not saying there's a right way or wrong way, but I, I think you want to understand that. And a lot of that's just cultural for how the board has been uh, over the years. Uh, cause, and I've served on both kinds, and uh, they're very different. And, and the things that you do as a board member are very different. And time commitments, right? Yeah. You got to think about time commitments, uh, meetings. You know, you're going to be on committees, chances are. Um, and um, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot. And, uh, I, you know, quite frankly, <laughs> I'll put a little plug in right here. You know, I, I'd be certainly open to being serving on another board or two at this time. Um, ah, being a retiree. Yeah, I like this. As, as being a retiree. That's correct. Yeah. I still have a couple of legacy boards that I sit on from the venture capital business, um, but I would certainly entertain uh, sitting on a board or two um, going forward as a retiree. And for anybody, young or old, this is a great example of how, I mean, you don't have to start a podcast and ask people, but you know, find people that are on boards and talk to them. Hey, what's this about? You know, I'm curious as to what the board that you serve on is like and what are the, the things that you do and what's the time commitment um, and really kind of kind of pick people's brains that once you find out that they're on a board. Um, and then I think people are always willing to, hey, if you ever need any help with this, let me know. Or if you know another board that's looking for people to help, let me know. It might not be as a board member at first. It might help with the committee or uh, one of the com- subcommittees or something like that. But that's a great way to start is find somebody who's on a board and ask them, right? I'm sure, Bela, if you when you put the word out to your network, right? It'll be pretty short order before somebody says, oh yeah, I have the perfect opportunity for you. So you'd be surprised. I know young people that are on boards too, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, once you ask around and figure out who you know that's doing this, talk to them because um, 
you know, my view on this is I think people have shied away from serving on boards, not moved towards it. Um, you know, there's some risks involved and there's, you know, there, there can be a, there, there can be some downsides to it, but overall it's really rewarding. And I've enjoyed the, the few boards that I've served on. And like you said, there's some negative things, but I've always gotten something positive out of it. Um, so yeah, I think it's a great way to get experience, build your network, learn things, uh, and make a, a difference in a small way, make the world a better place. I think all that stuff is really cool. So, um, so that was great. What do you think, Bela? Wrap it up. Yeah, there's one other quick thing I want to say. Uh, that, that oh, what please. you were saying there reminded me of it, and that is <clears throat> when you when someone asks you to join a board, or 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 you're interested in joining a board, treat it like you are interviewing for a job, because you are, right? And you have you have to think about it that way. So you want to make sure that that board and that organization works for you, uh, and and you want to make sure you have skills and value to bring to the table. And they should be asking you similar types of questions, not just looking for a warm body, right? Mm -hmm. I've had those experiences where, you know, they have an empty seat and they got to fill it. Uh, and the first person that walks through the door, they'll take. Uh, so think about, <clears throat> think about this as a job and because you're making a commitment. <clears throat> and, and as a board member, right, you have fiduciary responsibilities that you have to fulfill. So it's not just a, oh yeah, I'm on the board. Uh, you have specific responsibilities. You're going to sign off on the financial uh, uh, reports of the of the organization, uh, just as an example. So yeah, you uh, have to act in the best interests of the of the stakeholders involved, the best financial right. interests of the stakeholder. That's what fiduciary means, and you have to demonstrate that, and that's important. It, the the burden of proof is on you as the board member, I believe. That's right. So this is serious stuff, right? It's not just hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna sit on a board or two. Uh, it, it takes a, a fair amount of time and you want to understand uh, what, what you're getting yourself into uh, and that you can add value. All right. And you shouldn't agree to join a board until you sat in on a meeting and met all the board members and understand the financials, right? You need to look at all these things and ask questions. Are there any legal issues I need to be aware of? So on and so forth. So yeah, treat it like a job interview and do your due diligence. And um, But yeah, don't let the, those things scare you off. Those are small you know, those are small pieces of information to find. It is. It's a lot like hiring somebody. I think it's a great analogy, Bela. All right. Okay. I th so kind of some cool takeaways here from a really interesting uh, life story of Ron Coury. And uh, we kind of talked about the challenges that, that uh, entrepreneurs can face. And in some industries and in some parts of the world, these industry, these barriers can look very different than um, in Silicon Valley or in uh, in Boston. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting, uh, it was an interesting tour of, I think, some of the things that can uh, entrepreneurs can struggle with. Um, we talked about the importance of the background check and really doing your due diligence. Uh, and then we talked about boards and uh, the role that you can play in serving on a board and some of the things to look out for, but some of the real true benefits as well. Yeah, you know, and if, and if you want to learn more about Ron, uh, he wrote this great book. Um, so uh, it's available on Amazon. Uh, the title of the book is Tenacity, and if you look, search on Tenacity and Ron Corey, that's C-O-U-R-Y, you will find it. And you'll put a link in the uh, show notes, eh? There sure will be a link there, that's All for sure. Right. Yeah. All right, well, listeners, we're happy that you joined us in our podcasting adventure for this week, and we hope you found the last hour interesting and thought-provoking. At this point, we'd once again like to thank Phillips Lytle LLP for sponsoring our podcast. Bela, you and I both know the attorneys at Phillips Lytle think like entrepreneurs, taking a pragmatic approach to getting things done and spotting issues before they become problems. So if you need good, solid advice starting, funding, or selling a business, whether you're a single-person startup or working on a nine-figure exit, Bela and I confidently recommend the attorneys at Phillips Lytle. Bela, what's the best way for listeners to get in touch with them? Yeah, I suggest uh, you reach out to Rich Honan, uh, who is a partner at Phillips Lytle. And he can be reached uh, via his telephone, which is 518-618-1225. Or you can send Rich an email uh, from the firm's website, uh, which is philipslidle.com. That's P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S-L-Y-T-L-E.com. Great. Thanks, Bela. And listeners, thanks again for joining us. If you have questions about what we've discussed today or suggestions about future topics or potential guests, please do get in touch with us. We're always really happy to hear from you and are happy to respond. Our email address is bela.and.mike at gmail.com. 
Yeah, thank you for listening. Uh, we have a lot of great guests uh, in the pipeline, so I hope you'll join us again for future episodes. So until next week, signing off from snowy upstate New York. Hey, Mike, have a great week. Thanks, Bela. That's it from over here in Münster, Germany. The sun has just gone down, so it's time to get a verst and a beer and call it a day. Have a great week. <laughs>